Good morning, everybody, again. <laughs> We're continuing in our discipleship series, Discipleship 101. You can find it on our church's website. We're in the section, Responding to God with Faith. And today I'm going to be talking about God has given us someone who's completely trustworthy, which is Jesus, to have faith in, to believe in, to be saved by, and that's Jesus, of course, and that God also gives us faith through his word. My point one is faith through Jesus. He is trustworthy. The faith God gives us is rooted in his son who became flesh for our salvation. Our faith is rooted in Jesus. He has fulfilled all the requirements. He's paid the penalty for our sin. He's the author and perfecter of our faith, says Hebrews 12.2. But he doesn't work alone. Jesus does only what the Father wants, and he works by the Holy Spirit in our hearts. The Holy Spirit teaches us, convicts us, and gives us faith. So we're going to talk about Jesus. Why is Jesus trustworthy? I feel mainly he's trustworthy because he loves us. But I came up with three points. Jesus gave himself for us. Jesus is our intercessor. And Jesus forgives us. So point one, Jesus gave himself for us. Jesus was chosen before the foundation of the world. He was, before the world was created, he was chosen to die for us to pay the penalty of sin. He was creator and he took that on himself. That's just incredible. First Peter 1, 18 to 20 says, it tells us that we were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ who was without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world. Revelation 13, 8 says, Jesus was slain from the creation of the world. So we're building our faith from the Word, and these are scriptures that reinforce that faith, that they tell us about Jesus. Ephesians 4.1 reads, For He chose us in Him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in His sight. Jesus sacrificed Himself because of His love for us. Knowing and feeling Jesus' love should increase our faith. 1 John 3.16 says, This is how we know what love is. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. Ephesians 5.2 says, Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. Hebrews 12.2 that we quoted earlier says, We're to look into Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what <laughs> would. <laughs> he and Jesus walked this earth. He, was he went through persecutions, slander, scorn, ridicule, yet he was without guilt, or sin. Then when his time came to die, he suffered a terrible scourging and a beating. And if he would have been, he was beaten so badly he couldn't even bear the cross. Someone had to bear it for him, but they wanted him to bear it. So all of this suffering. And the whole time he was ridiculed and spat upon. Then he suffered the actual crucifixion of being nailed to a cross where he couldn't breathe. It was a slow, agonizing death. He went through all of that for you. Yeah. For all of us. He is trustworthy. Point two, Jesus is our intercessor. What does an intercessor mean? I looked it up in the dictionary. It's an act to interpose in behalf of someone in difficulty or trouble as by pleading or petition. So Jesus intercedes for us. Romans 8.34 says, Who then is the one who condemns? 
No one. Christ Jesus who died, more than that who was raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Jesus goes before the throne of God for you. Hebrews 7.25 Therefore he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. Jesus was both God and man. He was flesh. He suffered the same things that we suffer. He felt sorrow, anger, pain. He was gossiped about, made fun of, was falsely accused. He was criticized. He knew what it was to be hungry. He knew what it was to be like to be exhausted. He felt the same things that we do. He understands. There's no struggle we endure that God of grace does not understand. Why? Jesus intercedes for us. There's no pain of any type that we endure that God does not understand. Why? Jesus intercedes for us. There's no injustice we are subjected to that God does not understand. Why? Jesus intercedes for us. There's no human weakness that attacks us that God does not understand. Why? Jesus intercedes for us. There's no failure that God does not understand. Why? Jesus intercedes for us. There's no form of loneliness that God does not understand. Why? Because Jesus intercedes for us. The point being, Jesus intercedes for us daily. He is trustworthy. Third point, Jesus forgives us. Jesus gave himself so that we are forgiven of our sins. We confess our sins and Jesus is faithful to forgive us. Just realize the significance of that. You don't have to lead a condemned life. Jesus forgives you. Jesus doesn't want to punish us even though there are consequences to sin. He is for us. 1 John 1 9 if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Matthew 9, 2. Jesus heals a paralyzed man and tells him, Take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. And then in verse 6, he's accused of blasphemy from the Pharisees, but he says this, I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So you can believe that. The Word says it. Luke 7, Jesus was at a Pharisee's house and a woman who lived a sinful life, maybe she was a prostitute, it doesn't say specifically, she used her tears to wipe his feet and used her hair to wipe his feet, showing great love to him. And he says to her, your sins are forgiven. Colossians 3.13 Jesus says to forgive as he forgave us. And all of these are acts of faith. Luke 5.19 There are men carrying a paralyzed man and they couldn't bring him before Jesus. So their faith was so great they knew Jesus would heal him. So they go up to the top on the roof and they make a hole to lower the man in front of Jesus. What faith? Jesus tells the man that his sins were forgiven. In John 8 and 11, the Pharisees bring a woman caught in adultery before Jesus. He tells them, let any of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Everyone walks away. He then tells her, Neither do I condemn you. Go and leave your life of sin. In Luke twenty two thirty two, But I have made supplication for you that your faith may not give out, and you, once you have returned, strengthen your brothers. Jesus told that to who? He told it to Peter. And what did Peter do? Peter denied him three times. Jesus forgave him. There was no question. Jesus forgives. Jesus is trustworthy. He's trustworthy because he loves us so much 
that he gave himself for us, he intercedes for us daily, and he forgives us. God gives us faith that is rooted in Jesus. So our faith is in Jesus. He is trustworthy. Also, God gives us faith through the Word. Reading the Word gets me so excited. The Holy Spirit has really been working in me. I've opened my heart. I pray and ask for guidance when I read. And it's just incredible. The Word comes alive. It's not just reading anymore. It's just becoming a part of me. It's just awesome. So we get faith through the Word through three ways. The preached Word, the written Word, and what I call our God experiences. We receive the Word through usually the preached Word from messages at church, religious telecast, Bible studies. There's a lot of videos on the web. And we also hear the word through testimony and fellowship with each other. Romans 10, 17 says, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. The word tells us about Jesus, who is the word of God. The Holy Spirit uses this word to enlighten us and somehow allows us to trust ourselves to the word. This is sometimes called the witness of the Holy Spirit. For me, I call it the aha moments. The moments when you're reading, you might be reading the same thing that you've read a million times and all of a sudden you get it. <laughs> That's what I call an aha moment. You understand what it means because the Holy Spirit reveals it to you through faith. You have faith in God. He said He would teach you. He sent the Holy Spirit to teach us and the Holy Spirit does exactly that. When the Holy Spirit opens your eyes, you have no doubt it's from God. An example is Jeremiah 1.5. It says, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And in Psalm 139.13, you created my inmost being. You wove me in my mother's womb. I read those scriptures many, many times. But one day in Bible study, Curtis was talking about the Holy Spirit and it, it just, about a switch was flipped. God planned me. I am unique. I am like no other. No other can do what I can do. Now the same is true for all of us. We're, we're important. He accepts us as we are. He doesn't like our choices that we make sometimes, but he does work with us when, he can even work with those choices when they're not good for us. But that made a profound change in my life. I'd always lived my life thinking I was less than others, and I am not, and God doesn't want me to think that way. We are specially created and unique. And I had this dream last night, it was really, interesting. I was standing with someone I didn't know and we were looking at the sky. It was black and there were stars just lighting up the whole, uh, the whole sky. And I was talking to this person. I said, look, it's like there's one light, but it's made up of many little lights. These stars are individuals. They were planted there by God. They can't replace each other. And that's exactly like we are. There's many of us, but we're all totally unique. And all the things that we read in the Bible that God has done for people, He'll do for us. God's not a respecter of persons. But that really boosts my faith, those Holy Spirit moments, those aha moments. I was watching Brian Houston of Hillsong Church preach on faith. And he made a statement. Faith is not just in what God does, it's faith in who He is. Amen. And that just, again, I just have these moments of delighting in the Lord. I believe that's how the Bible says it. To me, it's just like soaring. <laughs> but that's what the Word, study the Word, that's what it does for us. God is good, God is love. I can have faith in who He is. He will help me understand. Our faith is also increased by testimony. 
of someone. And I work with a woman, her name is Sharon. She gave me full permission to talk about her today. She was an alcoholic for 20 years. She drank every day, all day long, and all night. And one day she realized that that's not what God wanted for her. So she got on her knees and she prayed. And what's interesting to me is, is what she prayed for. She didn't say, God, help me not want alcohol. Her exact words were, she asked God to remove the desire for the taste of alcohol. To me, that's a tougher prayer than just help me not be one. <laughs> and she said she felt this breeze come across her faith, and she's never wanted it since. See, that testimony is encouraging. That builds my faith. If he does things like that for her, he'll do it for me too. He'll do it for all of us. I was reading a story about a young man who was playing baseball and he falls down and his heart stops. He just stands in there and he falls down and his heart stops. His brain is without oxygen for 28 minutes. That's where you can't recover from that. And his family, and, and even his brothers, his young brothers are all praying over him. God heals him. No damage. Within three weeks, he's out of the hospital. Absolutely no brain damage. So see, that builds our faith. It's not that, we, that God's going to answer every prayer the way we want. But when we do see those experiences, it just it reinforces our own faith. And... Our faith is built little bits at a time, like little stepping stones. We grow in that. That's very encouraging to me. I'm constantly on the lookout for things like that. Because God will do that for me too. God gives us faith through the word, through the written word, through Bible study. Our Bible study has changed my life. <laughs> when we first started Bible study, I thought, Oh, I think that'll be interesting. I think I might learn some things. Boy, I just didn't know what God had in store for me. <laughs> it's changed my life. That's when I started embracing God and what he had for me. We, through the study of the Word. Our Bible study was the study of the Bible, going through it cover to cover. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. All Scripture is God-breathed, and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, I feel like that's what God is doing with us here. We're becoming disciples. It used to be my whole life it was just sitting back and watching and observing, and that was nice. Not anymore. I'm called to action. I'm a messenger. Calling all messengers, that song, I'm a messenger. We're all messengers. We're to go out, we're to be trained. John 17, 17 says God's word is truth. You can believe that. We follow the teachings of the word. Jesus used the word to overcome obstacles. Luke 4 is the chapter where Jesus is tested by Satan. He's without food and water for 40 days. Yet... Everything the devil brought to him, every temptation, Jesus responded with God's word. So Jesus used his word. Jesus, when he went out teaching, he always quoted scripture. He was a Jew, so they were taught. He grew up in a family that was actually taught scripture where others weren't necessarily taught. And he always used scripture in his teachings. The Bible's full of men and women of faith that we can see their examples and know that we can do the same things that they've done. God's not a respecter of person. Look at Abraham. He's an amazing example of faith. God promise, promises to make him a great nation. That all nations of the earth will be blessed through him. And Abraham believes. As the Bible says he believes. He's faithful. He goes wherever God tells him to go. God tells him he's going to make him a great nation. Well, you have to have children to have a great nation. So he's 75 and he doesn't have an heir. 
God promised him a son. Sarah was barren. She was past childbearing, but he believed. Sarah had Isaac when Abraham was 100 years old. So Abraham kept the faith. Now that Abraham had his son Isaac, what did God ask him to do? He asked him to sacrifice him. And what did Abraham do? He did. He gathered up what they needed. They went off traveling to the altar to sacrifice Isaac. The Bible indicates it was to the last moment when Abraham was going to kill Isaac that God stopped him and provided him a ram for the sacrifice. That's great faith. God will give you that faith. He'll give me that faith. Look at the story in Daniel 3. These are just such encouraging stories that just, I just get so excited about it. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, they refused to worship King Nebuchadnezzar's little gold idols and his gods because they believed there's one God. They had faith in God. They were only going to worship God. They stuck to that. So what did Nebuchadnezzar do? He threw them in a furnace. The furnace was so hot that the men throwing them in the furnace burned up. But they didn't burn up. And also, the king says, there's not three of them in there, there's four. Which the Bible indicates that maybe Jesus was in there with them. That's an amazing testimony. Their faith. They had faith unto death. And God delivered them. God doesn't always deliver them deliver us from our troubles but we can have faith like we said earlier not in what he does always but in who he is you can trust that if you want to read about the faithful read Hebrews 11 it's a full list of Old Testament uh, people that were faithful to God but let's look at the New Testament Christians they didn't the disciples didn't quite fully understand Jesus, what Jesus was doing. When he, was, when he died, they were kind of scattered or disorganized. They just didn't quite get it. But Jesus told them that he was going to send the Holy Spirit to help them. They had faith. They believed. They were struggling, but they had faith. In Acts 1, he says, Don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my Father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you'll be baptized by the Holy Spirit. I expect they didn't fully understand what that meant, but they had faith. Acts 2 describes the coming of the Holy Spirit. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Then Peter, who denied Jesus three times, got up boldly and quoted scripture from the book of Joel. <laughs> Isn't that exciting? He went from denying Jesus to feeling terrible about that, being scared, afraid, and here he is preaching God's word. God will do that for you too. That just makes my heart leap for joy. There's nothing that God won't do for us that's good for us. And look at Saul, who later became Paul in Acts 9. Jesus stopped him on the road with a bright light, blinding him, spoke to him, calling him. So he went from persecuting Christians, not sure if he actually had them killed, it's implied that he did, so he went from persecuting them to being one. That's encouraging and faith building to me. So the Bible's full of scripture that builds our faith. It's there to encourage us, reinforce our belief and our trust and our faith in God. So the Holy Spirit opens our hearts gives us faith as each as we build our faith they're like little stepping stones 
As we listen and study the Word, the Holy Spirit reveals the meaning to us, and our faith grows. And God reveals Himself more and more to us, brings us peace and joy. I know that from experience. We can trust what God says. Uh, you know, embrace that you have enough faith to believe. Faith like a mustard seed can move mountains. So the third point are God experiences. They can be miracles. They can also just, you're knowing the presence of God in your life. And sometimes they're supernatural. When I was working on this message, one that comes up right away for me is my job when I lived in Mississippi. I traveled a lot. I was on the road constantly. I was what they called a road warrior. I had traveled 6,000 miles in six months. But I was driving in western Huntsville, Alabama. Huntsville, if you've ever been there, has like eight lanes. You go down to six, go down to four, and then at the very west, turns into a divided highway. Right toward the end, where it became a divided highway, I was right next to a semi-truck, fully loaded with lumber. And at the very edge of the road, where it became a divided highway, there was a little quick mark gas station. A man pulls out in front of this truck. I don't know about you, but when I get scared, every hair on my body raises, and I knew death could be imminent at that point, because <laughs> I knew we couldn't stop. And the truck driver hit the brakes, black smoke is billowing out, and it happened so fast I didn't even pray for protection, but I know God was there. Because I, I just, it's, do you ever have a flash? I just knew it wasn't my time. And somehow, this little car put it and slammed it in reverse, black smoke, so that nothing happened. That's a God experience to me. I knew God was there. There's no way that kind of, I guess an angel did it. <laughs> it was, I always remember that, what God's done for me. I could have died that day easily. That semi would have gotten into my lane, jackknifed, I'd have been a goner. He was fully loaded. And sometimes our experiences are not miracles. I'm sure we've read, you know, and you've talked to people, testimonies of miracles. But I've had a lot of God experiences in Bible study. As I was saying earlier, I did really expect a lot out of it, but God started working with me. I guess it was just time. I had kind of been wishy-washy most of my life, just cruising along, doing feeling not a whole lot, but I feel like God used Curtis because I could understand what Curtis was saying and the Holy Spirit helped me connect that. That meant something for me. He made me realize, made me realize that I am important in God's plans, that I am a disciple. This is serious stuff and I want to step up and I want to live it. I want to be a bench warmer. The first day I walked into this church, I told myself, I don't want to be a bench warmer. And I haven't been. All because of the Holy Spirit. Holy, Holy Spirit opens my eyes, helps me understand, that builds my faith, and I get bolder every day. And He'll do that for all of us. And I can trust God as He's working with me that he knows me, he made me, so he knows my personality type. He works with me, he's not gonna push me too far. He, he knows how to bring me along and we all can trust that. God's not gonna, if you need a break, ask God, I can't quite handle this, I can't quite understand this, and God will do that for you. Work with him, trust him. He wants you to be successful. He's not gonna, he doesn't set you up for failure. He sets you up for success. He's for you, rooting for you every single day. I believe that and I feel it. I'm, for the first time in my life, I feel accepted by God. Heard the words my whole life. Didn't make a difference. I know them now. 
It's because I wanted God more than I wanted anything else on this earth. And that's when the change came. So, in conclusion, we've discussed how God has given us Jesus, who's perfectly trustworthy and worthy of our faith. He loved us so much that he suffered a terrible death so that we could be reconciled to God. To, and he's preparing a place for us in heaven too. The Bible tells us that. That is just awesome. It's amazing. And Jesus intercedes for us every day. He goes before God on your behalf. Cry out to God. He listens. He doesn't always give you what you want, but he always gives you what is best for you. You can trust that. He forgives our sins. Jesus forgives our sins. We can come before Jesus with a humble attitude, repentance, the right kind of sorrow. He is faithful to forgive us. We do not have to lead a condemned life with burdens on us because we don't feel forgiven. Ask, you will be forgiven. We also discussed how God gives us faith through his word through the experience of those in the Bible. It encourages us. Turn to it. You can't get encouragement without putting good things in. That's what I tell people. I pour good things in. I'm very careful about who I listen to and what I read. It's got to support the Word. And that makes such a big difference. God loves you. He is for you. He pursues you. Seek Him and you'll know him. He'll give you faith. Your faith will be increased as you study his word. Listen to messages about his word. Speak with others and hear their testimonies of faith because God will do for you what he's done for others. God says he will never leave you nor forsake you. He is trustworthy. He is faithful. Embrace him.